On November 16, 1969, the fully clothed body of a white female was found in a bushland off a freeway in Los Angeles, California. The victim had died of a massive 150 stab wounds. For over 46 years, nobody knew who this woman was. She was simply the 59th unidentified woman in the LAPD's cold case division, or simply Jane Doe number 59. It was not known whether she was a local or had arrived from elsewhere, and most importantly, the police didn't know who killed her and why. It's as though this woman simply didn't exist. When in 2015 she was finally identified, this only raised even more questions than answers. In this video, we are going to take a deep dive into the mystery of Jane Doe number 59 and attempt to answer the many questions as to who she was, where she was from, and most importantly, who is responsible for her untimely death. It's one of the more intriguing cold cases covered on this channel, one that continues to mystify the police and observers alike. On November 16, 1969, the fully clothed body of a white female was located in a dense bushland of Mulholland Drive in Los Angeles, California by a 15-year-old boy who had been birdwatching. The victim had died of over 150 stab wounds, predominantly inflicted to her neck approximately two days before her body was discovered, dumped in the ravine at the side of the drive. A tree branch had prevented her body from rolling fully down the ravine and into a canyon and her body laid against this branch just 15 feet down the ravine. An autopsy conducted the following morning determined that the victim's body had been discovered within 24 to 48 hours of her murder. The victim had been stabbed in the neck chest and torso with a common pen knife. Some of these wounds had severed her carotid artery. Defensive wounds were also discovered upon her hands. Police came to the conclusion that she had been transported to the location where her body was discarded in an upright position and that her murderer was a right-handed individual. She had not been the victim of a robbery or any form of sexual assault prior to her murder and had no drugs or alcohol in her system when she died. Furthermore, it was discovered that she had been killed approximately two hours after having eaten a meal. When the police launched their investigation and began studying the victim, they initially believed her to be between 20 and 23 years old, standing 5 feet and 9 inches tall and weighing around 110 pounds. She had green eyes, tinted dark brown hair, and vaccination scars on both her left arm and left thigh. She had a one quarter inch horizontal scar that was also visible beneath her left breast and the birthmark was located upon her right buttock. She had also received several silver fillings in both her upper and lower jaw. Besides these traits, the victim had no other distinctive features and she had no identification in her possession at the time of her discovery. Police didn't believe she was killed where the body had been found, 
most likely the body had been placed in the back seat of a car then driven to the disposal location where her body was dragged out of the car and around the trunk of the vehicle then rolled down the ravine additionally on november 21st a pair of liberty brand glasses belonging to a nearsighted individual were found approximately 50 feet from the location where the victim's body had been placed in the ravine although it's unclear whether these glasses are related to the case since this woman couldn't be readily identified police began studying various items found on her such as clothing and jewelry to determine where she was from because several articles of the clothing found on the victim had been manufactured outside America police concluded that she had been a native of a country such as Spain or Canada as her boots and jackets were made in these countries respectively other articles of clothing worn by the victim including cut-off shorts from Massachusetts a leather belt and a sweater a buckle on the belt was made of brass and the victim wore two metal rings one white and one yellow the yellow ring contained a red stone and the white ring bore Native American designs and was manufactured in Mexico unfortunately none of the aforementioned countries proved useful to the investigation instead police shifted gears and now focused on having her recognized by someone they even wanted to publish a photograph of her diseased face in national newspapers but later thought that it would be too gruesome and changed their mind the victim's face was forensically reconstructed to provide an estimation of her appearance in life artists created several composite drawings shortly after the victim was found later drawings were created by project edan member barbara martin bailey in june 2015 a big break in the case occurred when the victim's oldest sister Anne was contacted by friends who had been searching through the national missing and unidentified persons system and who had noticed a similarity between a contemporary morgue photograph of the victim and Anne's estranged sister in response to this finding and submitted a DNA sample for comparison to a sample retrieved from a bloodstained bra belonging to the deceased which had been retained and stored and from which the DNA had been obtained one year later in April 2016 it was announced that the body had been conclusively identified as being that of Reed Sylvia Jurvetson a 19 year old native of Montreal who had been living in Los Angeles for just weeks prior to her murder after positively identifying the woman police began working backwards and retracing her life starting from her arrival in California they wanted to know why she had come to California where she was living and what kind of people she was hanging around with they believed that Reed had departed from her home country of Canada to visit a man named John or Jean in California in the late summer of 1969 several weeks after she had arrived and just two weeks prior to her murder she wrote a postcard in the Estonian language to her family which described her general satisfaction with her life in Los Angeles 
and encouraging her parents to maintain contact with her via correspondence. Another postcard was also sent to her closest friend. These two postcards were the final contact her family and friends ever received from Reed. The hunt for suspects and persons of interest was on. As she was stabbed over 150 times, which meant that more likely than not, it was someone who knew her personally. It's inconceivable that someone would receive that many stab wounds unless they had a close relationship with the victim. Thus the police were right in ruling out something like a burglary gone wrong. More than likely, she was unable to defend herself any other way other than to use her hands to either block the attack or actually grab onto the knife. So the way we see it is she was immobilized, probably on her back, and the person might have been on top of her as he was inflicting the wounds, determined Luis Rivera, a cold case detective with the LAPD. Following Reed's identification, both her family and cold case detectives named several individuals of significant interest in the case. The first individual was the man with the name of John or Jean, with whom Reed had become acquainted when she had worked at a Toronto post office several months prior to her murder. According to both her family and a Los Angeles cold case detective, Luis Rivera, Reed had been absolutely smitten by this individual and had scrupulously saved her earnings through her work at the post office in order that she could travel to meet this individual after he had relocated to California. The postcards she had sent to her parents and a closest friend on October 31st had informed them that she was content, had decided to stay in California, and that she had found an apartment within a four-story building named the Paramount Hotel. These postcards would prove to be the final correspondence her family and friends ever received from her. When police tried to determine what kind of people Reed was spending time with, it was discovered that she had not established any other close acquaintances during her time in LA. Thus, police believed that it was more likely this individual or likely a roommate of his responsible for the heinous crime. Moreover, after Reed was killed, neither the man she had traveled to meet nor his roommate had ever filed a missing persons report. Composite sketches of these individuals were created by the Los Angeles Police Department from the descriptions provided by a witness from Montreal who had known Reed prior to her departure to California. This individual reiterated to investigators the fact that Reed had met Jean while she had worked in Toronto and also stated she had specifically traveled to California to meet with this individual after his own previous departure from Montreal. This witness has also stated that this individual had been a medical student who had closely resembled the door singer and songwriter Jim Morrison. It is also believed that this person, Jean, also had a slight French accent. The second individual considered of interest by the Los Angeles Police Department is the first suspect's likely roommate, a man with a Beatles-style haircut, possibly also named Jean, who is known to have informed a close friend of Reed in the spring of 1970 that he and the first suspect had lived with Reed in Los Angeles the previous year. This individual had claimed Reed had left the two men voluntarily. It's also believed that he had reassured 
Reed's close friend that Reed had not been in any form of danger when she had left the two men, saying something to the effect of, oh yeah, she was with us for a couple of weeks and then she left on her own and everything is fine. She was happy. The third individual that investigators consider a person of interest is someone named M. Lindhurst. This individual had lived across the hall from the apartment where Reed had resided at the time of her murder. And investigators hope he or she will be able to recall the last name and help identify either or both of the two individuals with whom Reed had lived prior to her murder. Another possibility is that it was Charles Manson or one of his followers who had killed Reed. The Manson family was a commune, gang and a cult led by Charles Manson that was active in California in the late 1960s and early 1970s. The group consisted of approximately 100 followers who lived an unconventional lifestyle with habitual use of hallucinogenic drugs such as LSD. Most were young women from middle class backgrounds, many of whom were radicalized by Manson's teachings and drawn by hippie culture and communal living. In 1969, family members Susan Atkins, Tex Watson and Patricia Krenwinkel entered the home of Hollywood actress Sharon Tate and murdered her and four others. Members of the Manson family were also responsible for a number of other murders, assaults, petty crimes and thefts. It was also the location of the victim's body and the possibility that she was seen alive in the company of the Manson family prior to her murder that prompted the police to suspect their involvement. What's also interesting is that a woman closely matching the description of the deceased had been seen days before the victim had been murdered with various inhabitants of the Spawn Ranch, which was the primary headquarters of Charles Manson and his followers, the Manson family, for much of 1968 and 1969 the year she was killed. It's also worth noting that the location of her body was approximately six miles from the site where actress Sharon Tate and four other victims had been murdered just three months previous. In the 1974 book Helter Skelter, the true story of the Manson murders the authors recounted a widely circulated theory that Jane Doe 59 was present during the killing of a Manson follower and was murdered so she could not discuss it. However, when the police interviewed Charles Manson, both at the time of her murder and after she was identified, he denied any involvement whatsoever. Although police have narrowed the list to suspects that they believe Reed may have known personally, it is also possible that there is a third party involved either directly or indirectly in her murder. The fact that she was stabbed over 150 times points to someone that knew her personally, perhaps someone with a vendetta against her. Maybe it was someone she had met only briefly, someone who liked her and pursued her, but she didn't feel the same, and this person decided to kill her, so no one else could have her. Ultimately, even after Reed Yurveston was properly identified, was properly identified, this case is replete with unanswered questions. The main problem is that not much is known about her life after she began living in Los Angeles. Although the police do know where she temporarily stayed in LA 
from the return address on her postcard. They don't know what she did, who her friends were, and who is this mythical man Jean with a French accent, or his roommate. The saddest part is that after leaving Canada and moving to California, her own family didn't make much of an effort to locate her. They never even filed a missing persons report with the authorities. According to her family, they always knew just how adventurous Reed had become in her late teenage years and presumed she was simply making a new life for herself in California. The Jurvetsons had merely made tentative efforts to contact Reed throughout the years, although all of that was fruitless. Her sister Anne would recall in 2016 that, in addition to the family's hope that Reed would contact them as and when she felt the urge to do so, we did not know how to find someone on the other side of the continent. Nonetheless, after several weeks had passed without contact from their daughter, her parents did send an individual to the return address written on the postcard, only for this individual to be told Reed had vacated the apartment several weeks previously. Shortly after, the family hired a private investigator, although this individual was unable to garner any fruitful leads. Despite these setbacks, Reed's sister emphasized the fact that prior to her being shown the online photographs of her deceased sister, she and her family had never given serious thought that Reed might be the victim of a homicide. Reed was a lovely, free-spirited, and a happy girl, her sister Anne said. She was deeply loved by both family and friends. Her brother, Tonu, held out hope until the very end that he would one day reunite with the gregarious, green-eyed girl who disappeared so many decades ago. His widow, T.U. Jurvetson, said he died in 2014. She was exceptionally bright, a straight-A student, she said. She was the kind of person who had a great potential to do something wonderful. 